Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this launch. I hope and trust you are well, wherever you're connecting uh, with us from. My name is Mbindyo Kimanthi, and I'm glad to start us off uh, this morning with a word of prayer. Let's pray. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the gift of life, the gift of strength, and the ability to be here this morning. We pray as we engage on matters of TVET, youth employment, and everything else that, Lord, we're going to discuss this morning. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for your guidance. We ask for uh, your grace. And we pray that we will have a successful launch of the strategic business plans for the three technical training institutions that we are supporting under the cooperative vocational training. Thank you, and may you bless us in all that we do. With love and thanksgiving, I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And without wasting time, I would like to now hand you over to the moderator for the session this morning, who is none other than Mr. Gideon Morenga, who is the technical advisor, uh, youth, vocation, youth Employment and Vocational Training Program at GIZ. Wana Morenga, karibu sana. Thank you so much, Mbindio. Yeah, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this panel discussion today. As Mbindio has mentioned, I work with uh, GIZ, and my name is Gideon Morenga. Yeah, so we also uh, going to handle or take handle this occasion in two uh, parts. So we're going to have the first part, which will be a panel discussion, and the second part will be the launch of where we'll have the launch of the strategic plans for the three uh, institutions. So let me also take this opportunity to just acknowledge and appreciate the audience that has joined us through the various platforms, uh, the virtual platforms. Of course, it will have been our wish that uh, we'd had this face to face, but we all know because of the COVID-19 uh, guidelines, then we are doing this uh, virtually. So thank you, our panelists as well, uh, for being here today. Uh, so in a short while, I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, to the audience uh, today. But just also to mention that uh, why we're here today is uh, we are launching the strategic business plan for three institutions that are supported by the German Development Corporation. And these institutions are Nairobi Technical Training Institute, Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology, and Thika Technical Training Institute. So that's the main reason why we are here today and we have gone through a journey uh, to be able to get to uh, this level. So uh, let's get right into it uh, with the uh, introductions of the panelists. And I want to start, of course, uh, as usual, ladies first. So with me, uh, we have Ms. Joyce Njogu. Uh, Joyce Njogu is the head of Kenya Social Manufacturers Consulting Unit. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. We also have uh, from the German Embassy, Mr. Thomas Vima, uh, who is the Deputy or the Vice Ambassador uh, to Kenya. Uh, Mr. Vima, welcome to the panel. Thank you. And also, we also have in the panel today our Chief Guest Source of the Day, and that is uh, Dr. Julius Joan, who is the Principal Secretary for the State Department for vocational and technical training. Welcome to the panel. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. So thank you, so let's get right into the discussion. I think uh, starting us off is, um, we all know, and this has been a discussion for quite a long time, that uh, the youth unemployment issue in the country has, is becoming a challenge. We are talking about an estimated of about 800,000 youths who enter the labor market uh, every year. But they are coming into, you know, with the very limited opportunities that exist within the labor market. So, so far, uh, estimates of about 20, 39% of the youth unemployment rate are being reported across the country. The question is, how do we address this question? How do we address this challenge? We also know that uh, the industry has been uh, raising concerns also with the quality of the graduates. Uh, that are coming from the uh, technical training institutions. The question is, how do we address this challenge? And let me start right there. And I want to start with uh, Madam Joyce uh, Njogu mm -hmm. from the industry. So tell us, what is happening? Where is this challenge? Uh, thank you very much. First, congratulations to the three 
training institutes uh, for the launch of the strategic business plans. This is a clear uh, sign that we are about to solve this challenge. But just to speak about the challenge, for the manufacturing sector, we are continuously evolving with new innovations and uh, with global competition, there's a lot of demand for high quality of products, for high competitiveness in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency and the cost of doing business. And one of the key areas of concern is the skills. Skills is a, a very major economic development uh, agenda. And without skills, the manufacturing sector will not go anywhere. That's why this is a major concern. So with skills, a lot of times you find that uh, the curriculum development has been done outside of industry consultations in the past. So we know that information and communication flow has been one of the biggest challenges in this country. Uh, working together as stakeholders in a collaborative manner, and we are glad that GIZ, through this cooperative project, you've already identified those gaps of uh, lack of collaboration mm -hmm. and uh, bringing us together to be able to look at the German way of doing things, where industry and the technical colleges are always working together, and then there's nobody to blame. <laughs> because everyone has been involved, and you are there to, of course, talk about the competencies that are required in the sector and advise the trainers on the areas that need to be developed so that we can help our young people yeah. to gain the right skills. Right. Young people right. are ambitious. Yeah. They are ready to learn. Right. In Kenya, the number of young people who are interested in learning is very high. Yeah. So the problem is not our young people. It is the system that is developing uh, the skills development for these young people. Thank you. Yes. You've just mentioned about the system. Yes. We have the PS <laughs> with us today. Buona PS, yeah. tell us, what is the perspective from the government side? Um, thank you very much for, for, for having me and uh, for having this forum on. And allow me to thank the, the German uh, government for, for this great support. Uh, they, are, they are offering to the Tibet sector and in the institutions for the good work that they've done uh, this far. I think it's a long narrative, uh, but uh, let me start by saying that um, there, there has been an attempt to, to expand the Tibet sector. And this includes infrastructure, equipment, training, and all that. Uh, but my, my, my feeling and my understanding is that we can do better. And what we are doing here today is part of the process of doing better. Now, when I talk of doing better and within the context of the system, first of all, we have to establish Tibet as a pathway, yeah. as a pathway of learning so that uh, right from school, learners appreciate Tibet as a pathway, not as something that you go to after you have failed to go where you wanted to go. Yeah. Uh, that is attitude change and perception change. Yeah. Then secondly, uh, we have to develop a culture and, let me say, a structure of training with the industry. We have to move away from the thinking that we are training for the industry. We have to train with the industry, which means we start from the time when we are developing uh, a curriculum. Yeah. You test the curriculum, then you move all the way up to the end, because even the assessment should include practicals within an industrial setting. Yeah. So we have to learn to train with the industry, and that is extremely critical. Yeah. Thirdly, we must provide continuous professional development for our trainers, because skills are changing, uh, times are changing very fast, and we must have trainers who can exist within current, uh, let me call it paradigm. Yeah. Uh, that is something that has also not been handled quite well, yeah. or has hardly existed. <coughs> Um, I, will, I will be talking more uh, about that. Yeah. Uh, once that is in place, yeah. then the, the next component is to look at the role of each player yeah. mm. within the Tibet sector. Yeah. That space is there, but if you don't have a structured way of having each player find their space, yeah. that can be a, be a big problem. And finally, uh, one of the things that I know, challenges that we are trying to deal with, is that in some of the training areas, probably uh, we may not have up-to-date equipments that are modern and that could fit directly 
into the industry. Once we take those various steps, yeah. then we'll be killing the issue of the gap between the training and the industry. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, MPS. And I think as uh, you have put it, it's a narrative of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we need to verify that. Yeah, yeah so, so I think also well, one of the things that also the PSU have mentioned is that uh, there is the cooperation and support that is yeah. coming in to be able to help and develop you know, our TVET system in the country. Yeah. And of course with us is the German Vice Ambassador yeah. uh, to Kenya, Mr. Vima. Uh, maybe just coming to you, we know that uh, uh, the German uh, dual training system has been mentioned globally as one of the most successful team yeah. systems. Yeah. What are some of the lessons that we can be able to draw from that? Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be invited today. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished co-panelists. Uh, I think this is a great day to celebrate the launching of these three uh, business plans. On your question, it is true um, uh, Germany and TVET go together, mostly. Um, uh, lots of people talk about the success of the German uh, dual training system, uh, vocational education and training system. Actually, the roots of, those, uh, of, of this system go back very long in history. You, you can trace it back to the Middle Ages. But when people talk about the success history, uh, usually they talk about the story of German industrialization and the role that TVET played in that. And I think clearly, basically, also subscribing um, to what you said, uh, the two of you already said, the key point, the key uh, factor for success, I think, has been that you want to link um, the industries and the need of the industries to what the TVET institution can, can offer. And there, unfortunately, a lot of times, there's a gap. And we are very happy that the government of Kenya also has identified that gap and has put a policy in place. And we are very happy to be part of um, the efforts now to close that gap. And the gap is between, between um, tuition and between curricula that uh, don't really match um, the demands of the industry. Um, I'm also in the embassy, I'm also responsible for, for trade promotion when German companies yeah. come here. Yeah. And I have talks with, with, with lots of these CEOs or, or trade representatives, and they tell me, I mean, I've, I've had this one uh, person, uh, this one uh, world uh, famous company selling prosthesis. If you, if you like a limb, yeah. then the prosthesis yeah. that you put on. Yeah. And he tells me, you find health technicians in Kenya. Um, you do find them, and they come out of the TTIs, uh, and then for the first time, they are supposed to fit a prosthesis yeah. to the leg. Yeah. Mm. They don't know how to do it because they've never seen a leg, they've never seen a prosthesis, basically. Because they've been reading physiology books for two years. Yeah. Uh, and they know that very well. They have a very good understanding of the, of the theory. Yeah. And I think the idea to, 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 to fill that gap, mm -hmm. to link the demands, is uh, great because it is, in the end, uh, a win-win or even a triple-win game yeah. if it works well. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the private sector wins because they have students, they have graduates that fit much better yeah. uh, 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 the demands. Mm -hmm. uh, they can work right away. You don't have to retrain them again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously also beneficial for the public sector because yeah. part of the training, part of the education is being done by the industry, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And even part of the cost. Yeah. And then, very obviously, it's, it's also a win for the students because they have, they have a degree that is comparable. Um, companies know what they get yeah. when they hire someone like that. Yeah. So they can find a good job, and so they can be useful. So it's, it's, it really is a triple win. And I think the key to making TVET successful is really crea creating these links. Yeah. It's not so much the, the, individual I mean, the individual player, what they do, but the idea is to link these players yeah. And, and that is where we also try to come in uh, from the side of the German Development Cooperation, yeah. create these links and support. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, it's, it's the Kenyan government and the Kenyan private sector that has to do it. But we as a German development partner, yeah. we try to support building these links. Fantastic. Thank you. So talking about industry, of course, we cannot speak about industry without speaking about manufacturing sector itself. Mm -hmm. I think it's 
uh, probably the uh, the largest uh, sector when you when you talk about industry. Mm -hmm. The manufacturing component is very very important because of its potential that it also provides mm -hmm. uh, to the country on a number of aspects. So just coming back to you, uh, Joyce, how mm -hmm. important is skills development in the manufacturing sector? Well, uh, skills development, I must say, is the core to manufacturing sector. Yeah. <laughs> you know that manufacturing sector uh, thrives in uh, hands-on skills. As much as uh, we are moving towards automation, yeah. still the theory behind automation is uh, about people understanding the logic behind uh, whether it's product development or use of mm. equipments to yeah. produce certain uh, products, uh, standardization of products. Uh, technology just comes to enhance how people use. It's not that technology is the driver, because some people assume that uh, once we automate or go to industry 4.0, we don't need people. Yeah. Actually, technology is about people. Skills is about people. Yeah. The products we are making are for the people and for the society to yeah. consume. Yeah. So skills development is uh, very important. And when you look at the national footprints, um, I mean the blueprints that are there, whether it's Vision 2030, whether it's the Kenya Industrial Transformation Program, yeah. or the latest Big Four agenda, yeah. manufacturing is core. Yeah. And uh, just looking at big four, uh, initially the debates around manufacturing just being one of the big four, mm -hmm. there's now a clear understanding that uh, whether it's food security, mm -hmm. manufacturing is part of that value yeah. chain. Yeah. Whether it's health, yeah. we just talked about it, yeah. manufacturing is part of that uh, value chain. Yeah. So we must think skills when we think manufacturing. Okay. And if we want to grow industrialization in this country, yeah. then we must uh, improve how people access the right skills yeah. at the right level and yeah. they get the right economic opportunities. And it can be through either entrepreneurship or uh, employment. Mm -hmm. Either way, they are well, uh, uh, they are able to be engaged meaningfully, the yeah. young people. Yeah. And from the onset, if they find a collaborative approach in the system, yeah. They'll get jobs. Yeah. Like what we are just doing currently with this project, yeah. we have more jobs than the graduates who are available under the current uh, three skill sets that we are promoting. Yeah. So jobs are there actually. Yeah. There are very many in the country. Yeah. And then people are unable to invest in a certain area. Like the people, they'll say, I can't invest in Kenya, because who will help me with the yeah. making those yeah. legs? Yeah. So for us to attract investment, whether locally in the village, you know, because if I want to start an enterprise in the village, yeah. my first question is how can I access skills locally? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I go to the nearest TTI and ask, are you offering this kind of course? Yeah. If they are not and they have no such graduates, yeah. I'm forced to import skills from another county, yeah. Yeah. which will be higher because somebody must get accommodation and all. So as a small business, I'm not able to invest. To Thank attract you. large businesses, yeah. they also need high level skills. So yeah. not only are we looking at basic skills, we are going all the way to very high-end skills. We need to perfect that value chain, as he said, continuous improvement. Yeah. As I graduate from TTI, that's not it. Yeah. I must continuously improve because the world is changing. Yeah. And COVID has taught us that. So we need to be prepared at all times to use our skills uh, for industrialization. Thank yes. you, Joyce. I think one thing you've mentioned mm. is uh, the big four and mm. uh, Vision 2030. I think mm. this has been mentioned uh, widely on a number of occasions. There's mm. a lot of references to, you know, this government's uh, long-term development blueprint, mm -hmm. you know, as an important uh, development plan for mm. a country. So talking about that, and maybe just coming back to you, uh, Piers, mm. what is the role of Tibet in the realization of Big Four? What is the role of Tibet in the realization of the Vision 2030? Um, once more, thank you. But before I come to that, I think maybe something that I, need, I needed to mention. Yeah. We need to look at our, I don't want to call it skills deficit, but let's call it skills gap mm -hmm. in the context of our historical education system. Oh, yeah. Our education system, right, uh, post-colonial time, was geared to white, white collar jobs. Mm -hmm. So the philosophy, the thinking of education system at that time was to get people who could go to offices, people who could replace um, those who are exiting, yeah. Uh, there, there was quite a bit of technical thinking and, and competencies embedded. Even then, if you look at um, uh, right from the Ominde Commission yeah. all the yeah. way, yeah. Uh, and each time we have tried to uh, modify uh, our education system, yeah. but because of certain ways of going about it, we have always fallen back mm -hmm. to what you might call the theoretical way of, of education, yeah. Um, and I think this seems to have informed quite a bit of our thinking around the competence-based curriculum. Yeah. 
Because if you take people through um, an education system where you get the information, you go to the exam, yeah. and you produce it, yeah. and you pass, and then you go to the next level, yeah. then all of a sudden you're told, now can you become practical in your way of doing things? Yeah. It becomes completely uh, very complicated. In yeah. fact, uh, having been to many parts of, of this world, at some stage I was involved in an education system. And somebody made a very light comment that yeah. those of us from uh, the African con continent were so preoccupied <laughs> with, um, I don't want to call it a theoretical way of learning, mm -hmm. but we, we seemed quite tied to certain philosophy of doing things. Yeah. And it takes a socialization process to change that. Yeah. And I think this is why uh, in the competence-based curriculum, yeah. As much as, you know, uh, it's been quite tough, mm -hmm. but we are trying to tell people, let's try and see if we can do things differently. Yeah. Let's not mm -hmm. tie our learners to a summative evaluation yeah. as life and death, and it is all <laughs> theoretical. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the kind of uh, resistance we've been through. Yeah. I was privileged to be part of that process. Yeah. Because people take time to appreciate where we are going to. And I think that feeds directly mm -hmm. into the challenges that we have of uh, practical and relevant skills that we have now. Mm -hmm. But now coming back to your question, I think Vision 2030, or the Big Four Agenda, because the two of them are linked, one feeds into the other, yeah. uh, is basically predominantly about uh, technical skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's predominantly about TVET, because yeah. people at the university will do the design, they yeah. do the big thinking then people from technical skills will go and operationalize yeah. into actual implementation of that theory. Yeah. And uh, therefore, whether you are talking about, just as, uh, as she was mentioning, yeah. whether you are talking about uh, food security or value addition and all that, yeah. or whether you are talking about universal health care yeah. with the technical components that are embedded in there, yeah. you are talking about it. Yeah. So, TVET is a main driver yeah. to the Big Four Agenda, and actually we call it super enabler. Mm -hmm. When we go for meetings, you know, it's a super enabler yeah. of the Big Four Agenda, yeah. because you need people with the relevant skills in each of those four sectors, yeah. each of those four areas, yeah. and she's put it perfectly well. Yeah. When you talk of manufacturing, you cannot detach it from the other three, yeah. because manufacturing actually is almost the, 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 the codes that runs through all this. And within that are people who need to have relevant skills yeah. to drive the, that agenda. And it's not, what he's saying is not the first time yeah. that we have engaged people. When we were struggling with CBC, mm -hmm. we brought the industry together, those from banking, you know, under Vision 2030 mm -hmm. Secretariat. Yeah. And one of the things that they really complained about is the amount of money they spend on retraining the youths that they employ in their... Yeah, yeah. And it is huge amount of money. So we started thinking, maybe at, I didn't know I would be in Tibet then anyway, maybe at the technical level, if we could find a structured way of training with the industry yeah. so that half of the money that they would use to retrain people who have already graduated, yeah. they can invest in Tibet mm -hmm. and we train together. Uh -huh. It will make it much cheaper so that uh, by the time somebody is graduating, yeah. they're actually working. Yeah. And within the context and within my thinking for Tibet sector now, yeah. one of the things that we must do is make Tibet institutions production centers yeah, yeah. in your various areas of specialization. Mm -hmm. Because when you become a production center, you will work closely with the industry, mm -hmm. but you're also training in a real life situation. Yeah. You don't, I mean, I'll give you, because I've traveled to many Tibet institutions. Mm -hmm. I went to a Tibet institution where they have 100 acres of land. Mm -hmm. Very Arab and very nice. We get there and the first thing I'm excited to see is I want to go and see your farm. Mm -hmm. Then I'm taken to an, a quarter of an acre yeah. of potatoes. So I tell him, okay, let's proceed. Then somebody tells me, we are still starting from this quarter. <laughs> the rest of the 100 acres or 50 acres is lying fallow. Yeah. 
Then I asked him, how many cows do you have? Because it's a very productive area. Yeah. He tells me he has five cows. Yeah. He has nine tractors parked there, mm -hmm. which are not doing anything. Yeah. So I think we are trying, and we are supposed to be dealing, talking about food security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are people who can do value addition, yeah. do production. So as you train, you also produce. Yeah. And in the process, you also get money for the institution, what we call A&A. &A. Yeah. So we are going to go through a serious mindset. Yeah for our governance of Tibet institutions yeah. and that will, is going to take a very short time yeah. and then we are coming up with a blueprint which I'm sure you're aware about yeah. which is going to define Tibet as a pathway yeah. and I believe uh, if you link that of course to the big four and vision 2030 yeah. it's all about Tibet the main thing is to get the relevant skills I'm not sure I've answered your question but I'm I mean, sure within the narrative, <laughs> within the narrative, yeah. you pick out what I'm trying to say. Very well answered yeah. that, very well mm -hmm. responded to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just, uh, I think if you're just joining us, uh, we are having this uh, live discussion today at uh, Abbey Styles Hotel, where we are launching the virtual, uh, we're having a virtual launch of the strategic business plan for three technical training institutions. Uh, that is Nairobi Technical Training Institute, uh, Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology, and Thika Technical Training Institute. Uh, we want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, the, our audience, all those who are following us through uh, the YouTube channel. We will also have uh, at least uh, five to 10 minutes as we complete this discussion today for you to send in your questions. So you can send in your questions, then we will have the panelists address your question. So back to the discussion. Uh, one thing the PS uh, you talked about is uh, there has been a challenge around uh, the quality of uh, also the trainers and the teachers. And one thing we know is that uh, KTTC has been training teachers for very many years. i just trying to pick some of the experiences I've had from some of the teachers. Some of them, since they graduated maybe, let's say, 1982 or wherever, <laughs> they have never gone back uh, for any uh, training, any further training. And uh, you also mentioned something to do with CPD. So can you tell us a little bit more about what is the government's plan uh, around that? Um, the immediate plan for the government is to put KTTC to what it was meant to be. KTT should be a premium training institution for Tibet trainers. Mm -hmm. KTTC does not need to produce artisans, to produce craftsmen, etc., etc., mm -hmm. because that can be done by other institutions. Yeah. That is why I, when I came into the sector, you find that every partner we engage with yeah. has a component for improvement of profession, or professional improvement of trainers. Yeah. And not that it's, it's a bad thing. I found some of them were being trained at Didan Kimathi, yeah. you know, which is very good because we need to work very closely with our institute, with our universities. Yeah. But I think what you're talking about is because KTTC lost the track of what it was supposed to be. Yeah. It is supposed to be a place for continuous professional development. Yeah. That is one place where we are supposed to have state-of-the-art training uh, equipment yeah. so that at every time we have professionals who are improving on their skills. Like now, when we recruited trainers, uh, the reason why the trainers were moving out of TSE yeah. is that not all of them are teachers. Mm -hmm. Some of them are engineers and yeah. people in various areas. Yeah. So once we recruit them, we need a place where they can go for pedagogical improvement. Yeah. They need to go and understand the component, uh, how they can now gel yeah. their practical skills yeah. to dissemination yeah. in a practical manner. Yeah. So I think we, we are working on that and okay. KTTC is going to be revamped. Um, just to digress a bit, yeah. uh, one of the things that we are also focusing on is for you to deal with change of attitude, yeah. we must make our technical training institutions attra attractive. Yeah. The first way to deal with a human being is what they see. Yeah. When learners get there, what do they see? Yeah. So the technical training institutions might be places where when you get there, you feel proud to be there. Yeah. We had a very embarrassing situation where when COVID struck, yeah. we were quickly instructed to get our institutions that could host. Uh, you know, people were being quarantined within a very short time. Mm -hmm. I was relatively new, and I sent officers to run around some of our institutions, yeah. and you can't believe it. 
Um, we only managed to get one within and around Nairobi. That was PC Kinyanjui. Yeah. Mm. So we had to come back, sit as a ministry, and take them, decide that they were going to our secondary schools. Yeah. Mm. Because the secondary schools yeah. were in a better state yeah. mm. to host the people who are being quarantined yeah. than our technical institutions. Mm. So if the learners who have gone through school want to move to the next level mm. and they cannot appreciate being in a technical training institution, yeah. then something was wrong. Yeah. Mm. So that became our first initiative. Yeah. We had a meeting with the peers, CS, and everybody else. Yeah. And I'm sure if you start going to some of our technical institutions yeah. now, yeah you will feel happy. Mm. Yeah. That is the first way to moving into changing mindset yeah. so that learners start appreciating that technical training is useful, both for the learners and even the trainers. Yeah. And that is where KTTC comes in. Right. It must be a premium training institution yeah. for technical trainers in this country. Very well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, PS. Uh, I think also one important thing you have also mentioned about is uh, the partnerships. And uh, I would also want uh, the Vice Ambassador to speak a little bit about why is uh, German uh, investing in TVET. And maybe before I get to that, I think we also know that uh, sometime back, I think in February this year, uh, the President, uh, His Excellency uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier was in the country. Together with President Kenyatta, they were able to launch the Center of Excellence for Industrial Mechatronics at Kiambu Institute. So I would like to welcome us first to watch a short clip uh, of that event before we come back to the discussion. foundation stone symbolizes the start of the construction of a new building. But more importantly, it symbolizes the beginning of a new and robust partnership between our two countries. A partnership, a partnership which aims at jointly tackling one of the greatest challenges Kenya is facing today, creating gainful employment for young people. Ladies and gentlemen, I have learned intensely about technical and vocational education and training in Kenya today. How it has evolved, where it stands, where it aspires to go. I have talked to the President, to the Cabinet Secretary of the Ministry of Education, to the leadership and trainers, and last but certainly not least, to the students and trainees of KIST. And I must say, I'm deeply impressed. Mr. President, today you experience the promise of our nation because through the support that you have accorded this institution, the ties between our two nations deepen and extend beyond trade and economic arrangements to secure our nation's greatest resource. And Mr. President, our greatest resource in Kenya is our people. This occasion is a symbol of the great collaboration between our two countries. Through your government, the youth who form the majority of our population will be better equipped with relevant skills necessary to help them play a big role in national development. The targeted institutions include FICA Technical Training Institute, the Nairobi Training Technical Training Institute, and indeed this institute, the Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology, which are expected to benefit in the areas of automotive, engineering, bodybuilding and welding, as well as industrial megatronics. So today, we encourage our brilliant young men and women 
to take advantage of the educational opportunities offered under this program, as well as the robust scholarship program under the German Academic Exchange Services. We intend to upscale this program to establish such institutions in other parts of our country and the assurance that your government will continue to extend support in the areas of infrastructure development and capacity building of trainers is something that is highly commendable and we truly appreciate as a nation. And if Kenya does not succeed in bringing these young people into skilled jobs, into proper jobs, uh, the stability of the Kenyan economy is in danger, and also society and politics and everything, and even the whole region. So it must be our main aim to help Kenyan government and the Kenyan society and the Kenyan private sector to employ these people and to give them meaningful jobs yeah. and jobs where they can upgrade the Kenyan economy yeah. and the Kenyan industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is why since 2016, TVET has been a focus area of German Development Corporation. Yeah. And since 2018, everything that we do in Development Corporation, even in agriculture and in other parts of, of the economy and the of society, yeah. All of that, we try to look at it through the lens of youth employment. Yeah. When we do um, uh, uh, technical cooperation, for example, in, in agriculture, it's the same thing. Yeah. We look at how, to, how do we make this sector attractive yeah. for young people to work at, because in many countries, yeah. Germany as well, yeah. agriculture is not, the, is not the most attractive sector where young people want to work. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that is why uh, we have to put all our efforts into bringing youth um, uh, into employment. Yeah. That's what we started 2016 or 2018, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. And what do we do exactly? Uh, basically, we stand on, on two legs there, um, uh, because also we have two implementing organizations. Yeah. One is the GIZ and the other is KFW. Yeah. One is for the technical corporation, one is for, uh, for the financial corporation. And they tackle the issue from, from two sides, but obviously they belong together. Mm -hmm. from, the, from, the, from the financial corporation, they are responsible for the hardware. Yeah. This is what we saw there um, in, in the movie. Yeah. Yeah? The, uh, the foundation, stain uh, foundation stone laying ceremony at the, at the Kiambu Institute, that was a part of the financial corporation. We try to uh, give loans and grants in order for uh, the Kenyan government to be able to build new centers of excellence, yeah. um, uh, especially in automotive, uh, bodybuilding and welding, um, uh, and so on and so forth. We heard about those. Yeah. Um, the other part um, is the technical cooperation. Yeah. And here we try to support, as I said, support the partnerships between industry and, um, uh, uh, and the TVET institutions. Yeah. Uh, we try to, to, uh, to help the respective authorities and ministries to develop curricula. Yeah. We try to, um, uh, uh, to enable them to uh, build a supportive regulatory environment for TVET yeah. um, and so on and so forth. So it's basically all the software aspects of it. Yeah. That is what we are doing and as you can see in, in the documentary, um, the German government and, and, and even the president uh, of Germany are very much behind this idea and are supporting it from top down. So um, uh, we all hope and, uh, and are sure that we can sustain this support for the Kenyan Tibet sector uh, for a longer time. That is, our, that is our goal. Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I think you have put it very, very clearly. Uh, the support is really meant to bring in the cooperation between the various stakeholders to make our Tibet system successful. And just coming back to you, uh, Joyce, uh, mm -hmm. from the industry, I think all the discussions around TVET mm -hmm. always touch on industry. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of what we're saying is uh, we cannot define TVET as TVET without attaching mm -hmm. the industry component mm -hmm. at the end. Because we are preparing youths who will transition mm -hmm. to the labor market. What is the willingness of the industry mm -hmm. to take part, you know, in leading the TVET training? What do they need? What, why should they also invest in this? 
Um, first, I must say industry has already identified skills development yeah. as a major factor of their productivity, which I said earlier, yeah. and their uh, factor in terms of growth. Yeah. So they already know that they are going nowhere without skills. Yeah. So that in itself is a major driver. Yeah. Again, industry is aware that uh, the difference between competitiveness in Kenya and uh, probably Germany yeah. is still around skills. Yeah. Because uh, especially the welding and such, we find that yes, we are welding, but uh, our finishing is quite poor. And yeah. uh, so we know, yes, there are many welders in this country, yeah. but how do we compare when it comes to the rest of the world? Because we don't exist in isolation. Yeah. Part of industrial growth is in our Kenya National Export and Promotion Strategy, yeah. where we must promote exports. Yeah. Otherwise, if I have bought equipments and I have the right skills yeah. and I don't get the right market, yeah. again, uh, there's nothing much I can do with my production facility. Yeah. So for me to grow productivity and expand and even utilize my capacity or my facility to over about 90 to 100 yeah. percent, I need a market. Yeah. My market is not just in Africa, it's also in Europe. The whole world is a marketplace. Yeah. So we are competing at a global level. Yeah. And when you compete at a global level, yeah. you must look at your skills. Yeah. And the skills are of various nature. Yeah. Uh, and, and he said rightfully from uh, you know, your competencies to your, even, I know we don't compare attitude and skills, but attitude improve how you look at skills. Yeah. And also whether it's use, use of technology yeah. or skills to innovate or yeah. create, yeah. Uh, all those are necessary for industrial growth we are challenged in terms of innovations. Yeah. Uh, consumers are constantly changing their preferences. Yeah. In this COVID alone, people have really changed the way they view products, yeah. the way they view the packaging of the products. Yeah. We've had a lot of challenges even with the environmental issues around packaging. So uh, one of the biggest challenges is innovation around the kind of packaging that we should go for that is environmental friendly. Yeah. And you look around and ask who has the skills? Mm -hmm. We are still relying heavily on uh, importing those skills yeah. or uh, inviting other companies that from other parts of the world that are good in things like recycling. Mm -hmm. So we have new areas of innovation coming up that sometimes we are challenged. But we are proud, I must say we are proud because of the COVID we're able to also have a, a first ventilator uh, certified yeah. by CABS, which is a good sign for us. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning that uh, with the right uh, pressure yeah. and innovation, yeah. industry is ready to grow. Yeah. So industry is very willing to participate yeah. because if they don't participate, they will shut down. Yeah. So if, if your survival depends on availability of the right skills, yeah. then you will be in need fully. Yeah. We have also been discussing that uh, we need to look at the trainers yeah. as service providers. Yeah. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the user of the skill is yeah. the industry. Yeah. They are the user. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the consumer also, and uh, consumption, as I said, uh, is from uh, the industry perspective that creates the jobs, yeah. and the real consumers who need those products. Yeah. And they also challenge uh, the way those products are developed. Yeah. And you know, consumers are very powerful. They can go to the streets yeah. to say they don't want to see your products yeah. uh, in the market. Yeah. So for you to make sure you're aligning your interests to the needs of society, yeah. you need people who are aware of those skills. Yeah. And that's why there's constant innovation, constant thinking around the trends. Yeah. And uh, this is a global issue, actually. It's yeah. not a, a Kenyan problem. Yeah. Globally, everybody knows skills are constantly changing. Yeah. And then how do we build that collaboration between industry? Mm -hmm. Who are the first to notice that they have become uncompetitive? Yeah. Because when they go to a market in America, they are told we no longer use this product. Yeah. So their next question is, what are you using then? They are yeah. told this, then they wonder, okay, yeah. where do I get a skill that can do this? Yeah. So you're either importing that skill, which is very expensive, mm -hmm. and by the time you transfer that skill, yeah. again, there's also competition in the market yeah. for the highly specialized people. Yeah. They are heavily poached. Yeah. So our idea is, how do we create a large pool of talented people in specific skilled areas so yeah. that uh, even if you poach this one there's another one in the market yeah. so industry is ready to also offer that support yeah. in developing uh, competencies whether it's through occupational standards yeah. and that's why we've uh, been volunteering in the sector skills advisory committees of yeah. the various agencies yeah. and uh, I, uh, through this program of GIZ we've been able to get uh, very good volunteers yeah. actually coming out and saying I want to participate in a committee around uh, automotive, whether it is industrial mechatronics, yeah. which is transferable, or uh, automotive mechatronics, or uh, bodybuilding. Many people are saying, I'm an expert in this area, I want to contribute. The challenge with industry is that even the current experts in Kenya, 
need continuous improvement. Yeah. They don't compare very well with an expert in Germany. Yeah. So that's why we seek this cooperation yeah. for benchmarking yeah. and also you know, upgrading our skills so Absolutely. that we know, you know what, yeah. if I want to drive a BMW, yeah. these are the skills I need to provide for Kenyans to yeah. be able to access BMW in Kenya. Yeah. If we want a Volkswagen to thrive in Kenya as an investment, they need local uh, skilled labor. Well. What are we doing to make sure they compare with the people, the same employees in Germany. The skills they have is the same skills we have here in Kenya. That's the only way we'll leapfrog all these uh, challenges of uh, unemployment and industry will be quite competitive. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Very, very important input mm. from you. Just coming back to Mr. Vema, mm. you, any addition to, yes? If, if, you, if you allow me, I would actually uh, like to turn the microphone around and ask a question myself if I'm allowed to. Yes. Um, because I think, we, we, in theory, we all know what it takes for, for, for TIVET to work, right? Yeah. Why it is actually beneficial for all sides. Yeah. Um, but then if you look a little bit closer, I think the key is basically loyalty, right? Yeah. The, the, the company invests in a trainee, yeah. um, and it is an investment. Let's not be, you know, let's not lie about it. And then in the end, um, it's also, it, it has to work the other way around too, yeah. Uh, the trainee has to be loyal to the company yes. and basically there has to be the perspective for the, for the trainee to stay yeah. and basically play out his full or her full potential in the yeah. company where he or she has been trained. Yes. Yeah. I've talked to Kenyan uh, business owners and they said, why, sh why should I be part yes. of this? Yes. Uh, I train somebody, mm -hmm. um, pay for parts of his education yeah. or training. Yeah. And uh, once they are done, they have their degree, they run away to somebody who pays uh, five bob more. Mm -hmm. So how do we, is, is there an idea yeah. uh, in the industry? Yeah. I guess it would have to be, it would have to come from the industry. It doesn't make yeah. a lot of sense if it comes from the uh, mm -hmm. public sector. Yeah. Um, how to, in, how to Im improve the loyalty mm -hmm. or how to give incentives mm -hmm. for this partnership between mm -hmm. the trainee mm -hmm. and the trainer yes. or training company in that mm -hmm. sense? to be more durable, to be yeah. more sustainable. Are there ideas? Because I, because I guess this is basically the point where it gets tricky if, yes. you, if you take a closer look. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. And that's why I brought the idea of poaching. Yeah. It mm. has been a major challenge yeah. uh, where industries, especially small and medium sized, who feel the pain of investing in, in an employee but they're not able to give a high pay, salary. Mm. But then we've been having a lot of discussions with the labor, with the labor ministry as well as uh, different employees. What do they see value in mm. terms of employment terms? And you find some people will not leave even if you add them an extra salary mm -hmm. because of the conditions of work, mm. the decency around how that work environment has been created. Yeah. And that's a big area in these programs that we're doing for youth employment in terms of understanding young people, first of all, yeah. the environment you create for them, yeah. the ambition space you give them for innovation, yeah. for decision making in terms of inclusion. Yeah. So if you involve somebody always in decision making, yeah. chances of them living are not as high mm. as somebody who's just a worker, checks in, checks out. They really have no relationship as such other than the salary. Yeah. Right. So that person lives first. In fact, they may live even for a lower salary, maybe because of proximity to their home yeah. or yeah. conditions of work. Right. So yeah. salary in itself is not the only motivator. Yeah. So the small and medium-sized companies, yes, they feel a short change because the poachers sometimes are the large companies. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, especially now with the, when people are upgrading the equipments, yeah. it comes with the service level agreements for skills development yeah. and, and you have to stay with an expert for two years. And just when they finish training mm -hmm. uh, your employees, somebody knocks uh, next door. I don't know if so, some of you were in a workshop we were had one time. Yeah. And one company said, mm -hmm. another company just comes at their gate yeah. for two weeks. Yeah. And uh, within a short time, 20 people left the business. Mm. Yes, they were there poaching and being explained to who is who. Yeah. Luckily for them, they had invested heavily in skills development for young people. They had a long pipeline of talented people. Yeah. So they just went to their database and said, look, we have trained you for a year or two. Uh, we didn't have jobs at that time. Are you available? Yeah. Mm. And they replaced those 20 people immediately. Mm -hmm. So we are not saying there are no challenges in uh, skills development. But at the same time, we are saying, what else? When we say skills promotion, 
even skills as an employer or governance structure within the employment system. Yeah, yeah. How do you make employment fun? Yeah. How do you utilize the skill? Because again, other than uh, uh, shortages of employment, there's a yeah. lot of underemployment. Yeah. Uh, or is it of employment? Yeah, All those challenges. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I come and say, you know, I can do so much more, but uh, people are only utilizing 10% of my knowledge or 10% yeah. of my skills. Yeah, so yeah. such people are ready to leave. So right. constantly understanding the skills capacity of your employees and making sure you're t utilizing that potential. Yeah. And that's why mm -hmm. people are doing productivity assessments. People are doing indexes around performance, indices yeah. of mm -hmm. uh, looking at your skills, your competencies, your time, and your output to be able to see, are we really creating enough challenge for you as a, as a person? Mm -hmm. Young or old, actually. This yeah. is not about even, uh, especially expert hires who are old are the people the employers are afraid of. Very they are not afraid of young people living okay. like uh, a senior expert yeah. who has been in the industry for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. The investment there is very heavy. The trade secrets are really heavy. Remember in manufacturing, you have my patents, you have my mm. secrets around how I yeah. make my products. You living, it's like it's part of the business yeah. has gone. Yeah. So, so I think it's, yes. a, it's, it's an aspect of uh, <laughs> yes. you know, looking at it from a bigger picture perspective. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very well. So let Can me I just come back to, yes. I just yes. wanted to react to two yes. things. The question you asked him earlier yeah. about why Kenya, why Tibet? Yeah you know, in terms mm. of German support and partnership. Yes. Um, uh, I still think that uh, probably as a country, um, we are just starting to get it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at our economic planning, yeah. you start checking how much do we embed mm. the youth thinking. I'll give you an example. If you look at our education system, mm -hmm. last year alone we had 660,000 uh, young people getting out of our secondary schools. Mm. Of that 660 plus thousand, yeah. we are currently going to admit, or we have already admitted 122,000 yeah. with a few hundreds into the universities, both private and public. Yeah. I think the capacity of the universities goes up to about, mm -hmm. the capacity will go up to about uh, 175, there about. Yeah. Now, if we have already admitted 122, we have 550,000 plus yeah. young people who finished school last year and they are somewhere in between. Yeah. That means as a country, and that is probably why the Germans are coming to, as a country, we need to sit and see how much are we investing in this 540 plus thousand yeah. young people who have got out of school. Yeah. Mm. What, we, what do we do with them to make them productive yeah. to the economy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the spaces we have in Tibet, yeah. both within the, I mean, within the Ministry of Education yeah. and other ministries, agriculture, energy, health, labor, etc., etc., yeah. and then consider both public and private, yeah. then you go to the vocational centers mm -hmm. that are currently being managed within the counties, yeah then you get the impression mm -hmm. that actually we can admit all learners who finish secondary school yeah. into a Tibet institution yeah. of some sort or the other, private or public, yeah. within the Ministry of Education or without the Ministry of Education, yeah. and they will all get different skills that would be useful. Yeah. Now, linking to what you've just been discussing, yeah. if you get relevant training, training for that number. Yeah. Then, in the long run, even the issue of poaching mm. and people trying to move left and right will not be there yeah. because we have ourselves available. They are energetic, they are young, they are yeah. creative, they are innovative. Yeah. But again, one thing that I, we, I'm trying to emphasize to our curriculum development agency, SIDAC now, yeah. other than providing technical skills, what are the soft skills that are strongly embedded within mm -hmm. that training? Mm -hmm. The ethics, the values, mm -hmm. the people relations, yeah. name it. Yeah. Because once you have all this well embedded within a training, mm -hmm. if somebody gets into an industry that has supported their training, mm -hmm. then the values and the virtues that they have inculcated in themselves yeah. will hardly 
make them move to the next institution yeah. simply because it is paying a little more money. Yeah. So the training must go beyond just the technical yeah. to embrace what I would call the whole humanity. Yeah. Because, uh, as I said, I've had the privilege, incidentally, being in Germany in my previous life, not now. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing some, you know, I was, I was on a fellowship, yeah. but to, uh, I got very keen on technical training. Yeah. And I had, I've also been to Canada, which where technical training is also very strong. Yeah. And one thing that we find that it's not just a training because you need the technical skills. Yeah. It's training embedded in culture, yeah. embedded in virtues and values yeah. and ethics yeah. that make an identity of who you are. Yeah. Mm. And I think these are some of the small things that will mm. take time. Yeah. But since we have already introduced this within the basic education system, yeah. it should help us to, when you get to the technical training, to be, so that you start having a way of life that embraces technical skills yeah. and the humanity that you're supposed mm. to be. Just, yeah. uh, I forgot to mention, uh, also another big area working is the mentorship programs yeah. mm -hmm. that we've started in industry. Uh -huh. And we attach you to an expert within industry. So the minute you join in, you already know this is your mentor. Mm -hmm. So they walk the journey with you, yeah. from your mm -hmm. attitude, to mm -hmm. your behavior, to your culture, and mm -hmm. to the skills themselves, so that you're constantly being handled. Because mm -hmm. young people have too many questions. They misunderstand sometimes the work environment. Some people think they are going there probably to enjoy life. Yeah. Then they realize work is work. So they need a lot of mentorship support. So that has uh, really helped, uh, even with the training of work readiness that we've been doing to a lot of young people. Just uh, how do you prepare for work? Yeah. How do you prepare for the industry you're training for? Because if you're doing automotive uh, mechatronics, then you must understand the industry yeah. you're training for and be prepared from the onset. Yeah. So the mentorship program has been very powerful. And uh, a lot of people have said without that mentorship, they would mm. not have lasted the internship <laughs> period. They would have just quit. Uh, a lot of young people also have a tendency to quit quite easily. Yeah. So they are supported to just stay on, build resilience, and uh, be able to grow in that nature. Yeah, so Thank the support you. system also yes. Mm. Yes. must also be mm. very strong. Yeah. Very well. So I think uh, as we started this discussion, uh, mm. we also mentioned that uh, we have an audience with us uh, mm. who are following this discussion. And we had also requested them to send in their questions. So I've received a few, so I'll probably just mm. pick uh, one or two. Uh, to the panelists, and uh, the first question is uh, from Horst Peters, joining us from German. Mm. And the question is, uh, to what extent does the Kenyan government support the desire <coughs> of individual Tibet graduates to become self-employed? Mm. So maybe uh, to you, uh, PS, you can um, address us. Uh, thank you. I think that, that is uh, quite um, prominent in the yeah. country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have various, uh, let me call them youth funds that have been created specifically to support the youth mm -hmm. uh, in their various, um, way, you know, if you want to start a small business, yeah. in their various entrepreneurial skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. Incidentally, way back in 19, uh, uh, I think that was 2016, yeah. um, when we were starting the competence-based curriculum, mm -hmm. we, we were meeting His Excellency the President yeah. in Mombasa, and he had a, long num a large number of youth whom he was meeting. Then thereafter, he came to meet us. We were briefing him on the curriculum reform. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that he was very keen about was how we are embedding entrepreneurial skills yeah. within basic education and that how that can yeah. move to the, to the next level of learning. Yeah. Because he told us, I've just been meeting this youth. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of money available for them yeah. you know, to start businesses through the government, uh, youth fund and all that. Yeah. But even those who have been given money, mm -hmm don't seem to know what they do, can do with yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So they're given money and they start struggling. Because it's at a small, it's a loan, but with a very low interest, yeah. which they're supposed to pay back. And they're completely unable to, 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 to know what to do with it. So coming back to that question, yeah. I think that the government has created quite some good structures yeah. mm -hmm. to support youth entrepreneurs. And, and I think that that is quite in place. And that is why within our training, we must give them not just, we must not just train them, to be employees, yeah. but also to be employers, to oh, be right. entrepreneurial is a change of attitude, giving them the relevant skills. So thank you. The government, I think, is quite on top of that. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, PS, for putting that out very clearly. I think your question was responded to. Uh, there's another question from Daniel Wesonga, and I think probably this would go to the industry, Joyce. 
has industry tried bonding trainees and mm -hmm. how has that worked? Mm -hmm. And you also added another component of the question, could a training levy, uh, has it been used before mm -hmm. and does it work? Yes, uh, I could start with the last one. The yeah. training levy exists, yes, with the National Industrial Training Authority, and it works uh, so long as you are able to follow the processes that have been put in place. First, you must pay the levy, you must be compliant to it, and secondly, you must utilize that uh, levy by planning a training program for your employees yeah. and utilizing that uh, training program. Yeah. You have to also inform them in advance that uh, this is the nature of training that you want to undertake for your employees yeah. and uh, this is the cost. And so long as you are within the cost, you get the refund. Yeah. And a lot of people are caught between the processes and procedures and losing the opportunity of receiving the refund. Yeah. So as the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we support our members to understand the benefits of the levy yeah. and actually utilize it to promote skills development within their employment space as yeah. part of also increasing competitiveness, increasing productivity yeah. and also employee motivation. Yeah. Because once employees feel that they're not just giving a lot to the employer, they are also learning and yeah. receiving, yeah. then uh, they feel more motivated to you know, use the new knowledge into bringing in innovation. Yeah. I also want to first say uh, employ employers also want entrepreneurial employees. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when you do entrepreneurial training, it's not just for you to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. One of the things we say is you must understand the business or the, or the mm. employer as a business. Yeah. So as you connect the tools, you must understand who are the customers? Yeah. What do they like? Yeah. What is the pricing model? Mm -hmm. Is it attractive to... Yeah. So even as you're connecting your welding and whatever, you must have the customer in mind. Yeah. You must have the business in terms of uh, excellence, productivity, yeah. what that means to the owner and to you as an employee. Yeah, right. Because if the business shuts down, yeah. then you have no job, like yeah, right. what happened uh, recently with COVID. Yeah. So it's not that entrepreneurship uh, education it's just for your own business. Yeah. Yeah. It is for everybody who is in any type of enterprise. Yeah. They must be entrepreneurial. Thank you for that. So mm -hmm. the, the the other question, yeah. uh, just remind me the, the second question. Because yeah. I've talked about the levy. <laughs> the, he, he asked about, uh, I think that was the attaching. Bonding. Oh, bonding. bonding. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Industries have uh, tried to come up with bonding mechanisms. Yeah. And uh, it boils down to loyalty again, yeah. where you have a trainee and you have a training development plan yeah. and you agree this training, for instance, um, some employers say any training that takes more than a month, they yeah. should bond you. Yeah. Others yeah. argue if I'm trained for just one day, what is the reason for bonding me? So yeah. there's the time frame of the training and yeah. the level of expertise that you're receiving. Yeah, right. So uh, maybe more than a month for some people, they say an years of training. So there are different policies which uh, I believe if we standardized yeah. uh, as at a national level, so that it becomes uh, mainly legal in a way that uh, there are many frameworks to support it, yeah. including the National Employment Authority. All right. So people have been doing the bonding. There are some employees who have stayed true to that, yeah. and they do their two years, mm -hmm. and don't leave because they have didn't finish their two years. Yeah. They stay on yeah. and go into another form of bonding for advanced learning. Yeah. Yeah. But if you train somebody and you have not prepared for them to utilize that uh, skill properly, yeah. And somebody else uh, identifies that and takes them, they are likely to live even with a bond. Yeah. So the issue has been how legally binding is this bonding structure? And uh, will a future employer, whoever is employing this person, if you notified that this person is on bond, yeah. is that ethical? You know, there are those questions around the whole uh, framework of bonding, and we welcome discussions on the same. All right. Also on salary increase, we are looking at benchmarking and kind of standardizing yeah. with the qualification frameworks. Yeah. Somebody of this <coughs> skill level, yeah. grade one, yeah. ideally should be paid around this much, mm. so that uh, if we are standardizing salaries, mm. people are not living because of salary. Yeah. And you can see other professions have done that. Other professions will come and say, okay, for my professional fee, this is the standard fee. I mm -hmm. earn 1% of the general work or I earn this. So if people can standardize a skill set as a business, mm -hmm. whether it's the lawyers or the architects or whoever, I believe, uh, and, I, and I'm challenging uh, Dr. Julius, look at uh, the, within the national framework. Yeah. Some people do it in other parts of the world. Yeah. You come up with different competency levels and advise an employer. Yeah. Because even HR managers are constantly asking, mm -hmm. 
how, what do you think I should pay this person? Yeah. And someone of this qualification, yeah. where can I say I've rightly placed them? So that you don't place them in the wrong place. Yeah. And the career path becomes cheaper also for the organization. Okay. When they take you at level one, they know for them to train you to level two, yeah. they need to increase salary to this grade. Yeah. So it is quite standardized and easy for anybody to manage an employment uh, framework within uh, a business. Yeah, so it's Thank all you. the interlinkage yes. you know, between the yes. framework and the, know, and the sectors also. There well. are some sectors which are highly paying. Yeah. Yeah. There are some sectors which are uh, also and, and I, I know I was also going to talk about the issue of women yeah. and the opportunities they are being given in terms of uh, traditional skills that women should go to. Yeah. And uh, they are denying them some uh, high income. Yeah. Because you are going to traditional skills yeah. that uh, have low income, yeah. very low capacity for yeah. growth, yeah. and uh, really nobody is going to promote you to high tech kind yeah. of uh, skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we also say part of uh, supporting the system yeah is making sure that there's some gender yeah. uh, gender equality in yeah. how we promote from promotion of secondary schools and attitudes around different skill sets so that both men and women or young girls can also and, be and young an boys equal, can have an yeah, equal opportunity an equal to, opportunity. Yes. very well thank yes. you for that mm. yes yeah, so i think we this is a, a very interesting discussion mm. which we can spend a whole day here mm. just discussing about youth employment, mm. youth unemployment, and mm. Tibet. Mm. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, we want to do a transition to the second part of our discussion. Mm. And let me take this opportunity to just appreciate our panelists uh, today mm. for the contributions that you have made. We hope the audience has learned a lot from this. We have industries watching, international agencies, development cooperation agencies. We have TTI agencies observing this. And I've seen, most of them have sent in comments and we really, really appreciate. Everyone is willing, I think, in this okay. country to be able to support the TVET system mm -hmm. and have it improve, move it to the next level. Mm -hmm. We need the industry, we need the development uh, cooperation agency, mm -hmm. we need the government as well on the other mm -hmm. side to support. So everyone must be able to work together. I think it's very evident from the discussion that we've just had from our panelists uh, today. Okay. Yeah, so just to bring this to an end, so we come to the end of the first session of the occasion for today, but then we are shifting gears and uh, moving into the second and most important part of our discussion today, and that is really launching the strategic business plan for the three uh, technical training institutions. Good morning. We are joining you from DT Dobby, one of our partnering companies in this uh, cooperative training model. And I'm here with Andrew Munua, Andrew Karibusana. Uh, good morning, Andrew. Kindly tell us, why did DT Dobby choose to participate in this training program? DT Dobby is a franchise holder for Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagen vehicles. The reason why we chose this cooperative training model is that we looked and saw that there will be benefits that are very good for us. One is that uh, this cooperative training model not only allows the young people in the country to get a chance to interact with the state-of-the-art equipment and get to practice uh, using the vehicles that we have, but DTW will benefit as well from this model. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, secondly, Andrew, kindly could you uh, hint uh, and uh, shed some light what the should the students anticipate to find when they come for the mentorship here at DTW? Oh, excellent. Um, when they come to DTW, one, they will find that we are only not a busy environment but they'll get to interact with people who have very good experience. We have prepared mentors on the ground who will be able to take them on, they'll be able to uh, give them a rough idea of what to do. They will not only get to interact with live models and uh, very good training models like this engine you can see here, state-of-the-art equipment, so the students will enjoy, they'll benefit, and they'll enjoy professional guidance and training within our environment during their mentorship program. And finally, Andrew, uh, could you uh, give a message to the industry uh, with regard to this kind of cooperative training model? Right. First of all, uh, the fact that DTW is participating in this program, it means that as an industry, we benefit by having uh, students who have got very good uh, learning that has taken place. So in terms of their skill will be good and so the skill gap will be addressed. Number two, when they finish their training and they come for work, uh, for work in the company, there is a shorter learning gap 
and that means that we have very short period of time for them to get to learn to understand how things go and so it's much beneficial for the company because there's a shortened learning curve. So what I would tell the industry is that this is a very good program. I would really encourage other companies to get involved because this is not only beneficial for the country, it will provide employment for the youth as well. As you've heard, we are all set and uh, the companies will be waiting to receive the students for their first mentorship block. Uh, back to you, Gideon, at the launch of the strategic business plans. Uh, welcome back to our discussion today and uh, basically moving into the second part of our, our occasion and this is the launch of the strategic business plan. I think from the discussion it was very evident that uh, industry TTI collaboration was mentioned a lot and uh, this time we want to move specifically into a German Development Corporation supported project which is the promotion of youth employment and TVET project which uh, has an aim or a goal of uh, pioneering an employment-oriented uh, cooperative vocational training scheme. So just to give us an understanding of what is cooperative vocational training scheme, I want to welcome Mr. Host Bounfeld, who is uh, the program manager uh, for the promotion of youth employment and TVET project at GIZ to give us some insights to this. So hosts, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, um, I won't uh, take long. Uh, my goal is in four or five minutes to give you understanding what we understand by cooperative training. Yeah, we heard in the panel discussion, um, um, the economy is getting more and more complex, uh, manufacturing, um, automotive, all the other services sectors are increasingly demanding more skills. Nowadays, a simple mechanic cannot do the job because many electrical parts are involved, so we need maybe a mechatronic. So things are getting complex. Let's call the experts. The question is where we get the expert from. Um, and we want to produce that experts in Kenya, experts made in Kenya, so we don't want to export, import the expert from other uh, parts. So, good. Okay, um, we learned in the panel discussion what we have in Kenya. We have a very useful population, many young persons. PS explained that this year alone 600 something thousand. Um, and on the other hand, we need uh, in the industry it's a lot of experts, people who have not only the theoretical knowledge but also the practical skills to. Um, let's say, accomplish things, um, the right competences, so to speak. Yeah, um, in the present system, if you say, okay, if you come out of uh, school and you want to enter the labor market, you have various options. Okay, you can go to the informal sector, to Akali sector, that is what many people do. You can also go to the TVET sector and of course higher education, but all this, um, how the system is structured at the moment, we heard it from the industry, all these sectors have, of course, a lot of challenges and limitations. So if you go to the Joakali sector, you learn a lot of things manually, and maybe you know how to do things, but you don't know how to connect the yellow wire to the red wire and this one there, because you do it because your master craftsman has teached you that, but you cannot really transfer it to a different context and also uh, it's not really um, regulated what to learn through the competencies. In the TVET sector, um, we have very um, regulated, let's say, um, curriculas, etc. But here we face often that um, the education is, let's say, uh, a little bit too theoretical. So all these sectors have his its limitations, so um, on the one hand, maybe too theoretically, on the other hand, not really based on uh, standards. So we want to um, improve the uh, TVET system by introducing something like cooperative training. So I would like to um, share some ideas uh, with you which have been developed um, by the TVET institutions, the industry experts, 
and uh, array of other people from the sector. Um, so in cooperative training, actually, it's based on a, a competency-based curricula. Uh, but the innovative aspect is, so to speak, that you have an in-company training plan where people get mentored in the company, what uh, Madame Joyce has just mentioned, the mentoring aspect. Um, and you have also a TDI-based training plan which together forms a, uh, covers a seabed curricula. And uh, by that way, you transfer the necessary competencies in theory, so people have the background, they know why they are connecting the wire here. Um, on the other hand, they have also the right hands-on skills. They don't only know, okay, how I should do it in theory from reading books, but they have serious uh, industry exposure. Um, good, so by that way, we want to create these experts we were talking about uh, here in Kenya. Good. Um, in this project, uh, we joined hands with three technical training institutions um, and uh, industry, and um, together there have been developed um, training schemes for industrial mechatronics uh, together with the Kiambu Institute for Science and Technology automotive mechatronics together with Nairobi TTI, and um, then auto body technology together with Tika Technical Training Institute. Good, how that um, is structured, that is a brief overview. So the curriculum has been developed together in close cooperation with industry experts. Uh, so education world and industry um, have define what is actually needed in these three technical areas. Um, the whole training scheme, if you join it from the beginning to the end, would take roughly two to two and a half years, depending on the uh, specific vocational profile. And um, at the end, um, you get a CDAC level six certificate, a Kenyan certificate, and at the same time, um, uh, so-called level C certificate from the German Chamber of Commerce in East Africa. So that means uh, the ambition is really to um, train according to international comparable standards. Just what um, Kam has already mentioned, we are competing globally and we need also globally competitive uh, young people in the industries. 50% um, is implemented in the company and 50% of the training time is spent in the TTI. The student always rotate for three months, roughly 12 weeks uh, between the company and the TTI. And uh, imagine if you have that kind of exposure, you get three months to the institution, three months industry, institution industry, and you do that for two years, you have really a sophisticated industry exposure, and that also helps you to develop that soft skills uh, Warner PS was talking about, um, because you know exactly what behavior is uh, demanded in the industry, and you know what kind of attitude you must develop or have to actually uh, be a successful industrial expert. So that is um, the major layout, how the training is structured. Uh, just let's have a, a brief look uh, at it. Like I said, say, in the orange um, chart, in the orange part, the uh, seabed curricula, which is, a, let's say, a normal Kenyan curricula, the innovative aspect is that it has been, so to speak, um, translated into a company training plan and a TTI training plan, which complement each other. So they are aligned to each other. Um, on the other hand, what is um, also important, uh, an important aspect is the blue part of, the, of this chart. This is a trainee. Um, we believe that the trainees are one of the most important aspect of the, um, of the successful, let's say, training scheme. Um, the same way you cannot make a professional football player out of myself. You can train me 10 years. I would never be really a good football player. Um, the same way we think that, um, let's say, job orientation and uh, selection 
and advice to young people which professional career they should join is equally important to get, so to speak, the right talented people into the right training scheme. Um, good. Um, so in our case, um, what is in this training scheme proposed is a, a, a kind of training agreement between the company, the TTI, and the uh, trainee um, to actually undertake that training. Good. So, um, of course, assessment is ongoing according to the competency-based, um, let's say, standards in assessment. Good. Okay. Yeah, that is um, another explanation what I just outlined for the trainings, for the trainees. Really, really important. Um, we have at the moment the situation where we have actually more requests from the industry for training slots or more offers from the industry for training slots than we have uh, capacities uh, for the first pioneer class. So, of course, with the next intake, we can then take on more students. Um, but it's really important that companies have a say in who to mentor. I think to just um, send people to companies um, in the hopes that they um, learn something that will not really work. So we need to involve the industry uh, in the creation of the curricula, in the selection of the students, and in the implementation of the training. So that, we believe, is the secret behind creating experts made in Kenya. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, host, for giving us some insights on uh, what cooperative vocational training is. Uh, I think we looking at the main event for the day, launch of the strategic business plan. This is a process that was already undertaken by the three institutions. And uh, I just want to invite uh, one of the principals to represent uh, the three other principals, and that is uh, Madam Gloria Mtungi, who is the chief principal for Nairobi Technical Training Institute, just to give us some understanding on the journey they went through in developing this strategic business plan. Madam Glory, okay, thank, you thank you, Gideon. Uh, the panelists, the PA principal secretary, the Germany representative of the ambassador, come representative, my colleagues, principals from Lika TTI and Kiambu. Good morning. I want to start by thanking our ministry, Minister of Education, for identifying the three of us, that is Nairobi TTI, Vika TTI and Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology to be the centers of excellence so that we can be part of this program. The centers of excellence is embedded in the Vision 2030 and for us it has been a journey. It has been a journey coming up with the strategic plan that we are launching today which is a five-year blueprint for the three institutions and each institution came up with a strategic plan with the collaboration with the GIZ and the International Integrated Management Consultants who assisted us to take us through the process of developing the strategic plan. We looked at our internal and external environments critically because this is not just any other strategic plan. This was to be a quality strategic business plan that is going to leave impact, in not, not only in the three institutions, but where the other rest of the TVET institutions in this country are going to come and benchmark. We came up with strategies. We came up with activities on how we are going to implement these strategies. And we involved everybody in the institution, including the Board of Governors. And I'm very happy that any time we brought in any management level and they hand what we are coming up with, they were very excited because this is like a turnaround of our TVET institutions where we are bringing in the industry as we have heard from our panelists today that there is no skills that can be relevant if the owners or the consumers of these skills are not involved. So today we are very proud, peers, to tell you that as the three institutions, ours is to promise that we are going to implement because we develop documents 
that we keep on the shelves, but these ones we have already started implementing. We have already admitted students online in collaboration with industry in the process because it's the first time in the history of this country where the industry has been involved in training of our trainees. And thank you so much for this. We are looking forward to the launch and we are going to implement and support the progress. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Glory. And also just to let you know that uh, I want to acknowledge also the presence of the other principals as well. Buana um, Sami Cheriot, the principal Thika Technical Training Institute is also here, as well as uh, Mr. Njungu is also Michael Njungu, also the principal of Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology is also with us. Earlier on, we also spoke to the chairman of uh, the Board of Governors for Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology, and that is Dr. Josiah Kamau, and this is what he had to say. Uh, my name is uh, Josiah Kareu Kamau. I am the chairman of the Board of Governors, Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology. Our country, Kenya, has been undergoing rapid technological development, and uh, the issues that we have had with this is that this we don't have competent human resource to match the technological development of the country. So there has been a mismatch between what is required in the market and the graduates that we have been producing from our institutions. The government noted that we required to change how the training was done in the institutions. And that's why we had this German-Kenya cooperation to have uh, the training which was going to impact on the growth of the economy. We are very happy as an institution, as a board, because we'll be producing graduates who are going to go directly to market and help grow, grow the economy of the country directly. We would uh, like to thank the industries which are working with us. Like I said, we are going to have students in the institute for three months and in the industry for another three months. We are also happy with the German government for having assisting, assisted us to uh, achieve this goal. Uh, as a board of governors, we promise that we are going to help in the monitoring and evaluation of this project to its completion. My name is Dr. Joseph Njogona Mugudu. Currently, I'm the chair, board of governors, Thika Technical Training, and therefore I take this opportunity to thank the entire team for this great occasion that we've created today to ensure that the launch of this uh, strategic plan is in place. Uh, Thika Technical Training Institute has a working uh, strategic plan which encompasses uh, skills empowerment, uh, skills development, and impartation of values and attitudes to trainers, uh, to trainers and trainees. This uh, uh, launch of the strategic plan is significant in that it aligns with our uh, institute strategic plan. It also aligns with um, the government agenda, and it also aligns with the global agenda and our <coughs> vision 2030 and our sustainable development uh, goals. And therefore, we as an institute, we see a great opportunity, one, to be able to uh, stamp our mark and authority in the region and in this great town of Thika where we have so many industries in automotive and related. And therefore, it will become um, a major attraction for various uh, skills, for various um, attitudes, and even for trainees to come to get the right uh, skills and relevant attitudes to serve the community and the manufacturing sector. The, this approach of the, the dual model uh, is a major milestone which has made most of the developed countries to gain milestones in the manufacturing sector and almost across all their sectors of development. This helps them to ensure that the trainees do not only get the theoretical and practical skills in the training centers, but they are aligned with the current strategies and approaches in the industry. And this helps the trainees to fit very well once they graduate. I want to thank uh, the permanent secretary uh, State Department of Vocational Education for gracing this occasion uh, for the launch of the strate uh, strategic business plan uh, under the German uh, government cooperation with Kenyan government. I also want to thank uh, the German uh, deputy ambassador for gracing this occasion. 
I also want to greatly thank the Kenya Zishan manufacturers uh, for gracing this occasion, bearing in mind that you will be the prime consumers of the products of Thika Technical Training Institute under the Automotive uh, Center of Excellence, and therefore we really appreciate all other stakeholders. I want to thank you, and I would request that you can even partner with us more in many other sectors and in many other areas of training, because Thika Technical Training Institute is a great institute which has a great future, and we would want you to join and partner with us in many other areas. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, DT Dobby and uh, Bonapies, as you can be able to see uh, from the industries, they are ready. They are ready to cooperate. They are ready to take part in the project. I think uh, Joyce also mentioned uh, very well in terms of uh, the industry are ready to cooperate. They are ready to participate. So we just need to work together as the Vice Ambassador mentioned, so that we are able to arrive at a consensus to make uh, this process successful. So ladies and gentlemen, as uh, we come to the tail end, or rather the climax of our event today, uh, which leads to unveiling of the strategic business plan, I want to take this opportunity to invite our chief guests uh, for the event today, this is Dr. Julius Joan, who is the Principal Secretary uh, for the State Department for Vocational and Technical Training. To just say one or two words, uh, probably that you would have wanted at least the audience to be able to hear from you, and then you lead us into unveiling this strategic business plan. And I think we'll request you to oh. just stand here. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so just say one or two uh, remarks. Okay. And also, uh, when we are ready to launch, I uh, will gladly offer you this. Uh, right okay. now, we, okay. uh, we're talking about uh, innovation. Okay. Eh? Yes, I know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, so probably uh, there. Yes. Yeah, so you can just move your brown piece. Okay. So you can give your remarks, uh, maybe two or three words, and then I will hand over this to you. Okay, I think mine is very brief, uh, to thank you all for, for this great occasion. We want to thank the, 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 the German government through uh, the Deputy Ambassador for the great support that they're giving us in the TV sector. Allow me to thank the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Thank you, Joyce, for being with us. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for, for the good work that has been done, uh, the institutions and all of us who are uh, part of this process. I think the only thing I can add is to give a commitment that we are going to provide a transformative approach to TV training in the country. And we are inviting everybody to be part of that change. That TV, which has been uh, more or less like uh, a giant which has been in slumber, <laughs> must wake up and meet the needs of what the country requires. I'm very excited about this launch because, as you see, it's not just a strategic plan. It's the launch of business strategic plan. That means within the training, there's an embedded component of entrepreneurial skills and enhancing business uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, all the participants who have been part of this, thank you very much. I think it's a great occasion. We look forward to the next level of getting the plan actually implemented as defined, so that it ceases being just being on pen and paper, but being actually what we intend to do. Actually, what I'm trying to do within the time that I'm here is to ensure that we do little talking, little theory, and implement the practical skills that the country requires. And you can be sure we are going to do that. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, now, I don't know how we are supposed to go about it. All right, thank you, thank you, Madam Pierce. So I will ask the Vice Ambassador to also join uh, on the other sorry. sorry. Yeah, on the other side. So Not maybe you can stand with here. With or without? Would you like me to wear the mask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, just move. Off. Mm. Just focus on the front. <laughs> All right. So then Pierce here. Yeah. All right. So you will take this. So we'll do a countdown. Okay. So what do I? Five, two, then you please. Okay. What? Hey, mm -hmm. so okay, we'll listen. Okay, right, that's fine. Technology? Yeah, technology. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, we are going to do a countdown five to one, 
and mm -hmm. then we'll do the unveiling. So the team, are we ready on that side? Are we set? Yeah. All right, let's go. Uh, let's start. Five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank so you very much. Thank you. Oops. Um, okay. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bora Pierce. We you, really you. appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, the strategic business plan is now uh, officially launched. Yeah. And I think it's now the responsibility of now the institutions to be able to actualize this. Mm -hmm. So just as we conclude, maybe I'd request you just to go back to your seat. So okay. thank you so much. Uh, let me invite um, Bindio uh, just to give us some uh, vote of thanks and then the closing prayer. So Bindio, Karibu Sana. This, we still have this. Yeah. All right. Uh, Thank you so much, Bwana uh, Gideon, and thank you so much for moderating uh, this launch very well. Mm. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our amazing guests. Bwana P.S., thank you so much for coming. Thank I know you had a busy schedule and had to travel back to Nairobi just to join us, so thank you so much for that sacrifice and also for reminding us that T Tibet is a super enabler, yeah. you know, of the development agenda. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate Kam. Madam Joyce, thank you so much for uh, representing uh, the organization. We really appreciate. And also for you know, reminding us about constantly um, you know, understanding employees and, 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 and that you know, government able to train, or rather um, uh, private sector has opportunities that are ready to take on students when they are ready you know, to be able to join the industry. So thank you so much for that. And also the deputy ambassador, um, Mr. Thomas Vima, and also for the support that you have granted and uh, that has enabled us to be able to support the training institutions that we have been able to partner with. We really, really greatly appreciate and also for your presence. Please, when you go back, pass our regards uh, both to Madam Phyllis Wakiaga and also to the ambassador. We really appreciate um, uh, you being here for the launch this, this afternoon. Thank you also for the presenters uh, who did a fantastic job uh, just taking us through the, the entire session. We really appreciate and also the principles. I know you might not have seen the principles of the uh, technical training institutions except Madame Glory, uh, the dynamics of uh, the time we are working in. And so we really appreciate uh, the fact that the principals uh, were able to join us for this launch. Thank you so much. And we look forward you know, to work with you and work with you as we implement uh, the strategic uh, business plans that we have launched. I would not like to forget the guests that joined us online on youtube you know following the conversation two hours it's not something that we take for granted so thank you for taking time representatives from private sector uh, from training institutions um, from government uh, we had uh, people uh, from you know the different tibet agencies that work with the government we really appreciate you sacrificing your time to follow the conversation to send in questions and that engagement would not have been fruitful uh, without your support and last but not least uh, the service providers who also helped us make this a success. You know, the photographers, videographers, and the live streaming. Of course, uh, you can, we appreciate the challenges that come with technology, but thank you so much to our audience for being patient and following through this conversation. I'd now like to request that we close with a word of prayer, and then uh, we will have ended our lounge this morning. Let's pray. We thank you, God, because we've had a successful event. We've had very engaging discussions. We've had um, you know, ideas that have been shared. And we pray as we go forth and implement the strategic business plan that you will give us the courage, you will give us the strength, you will give us the resources that we require, both human capacity but also financial, to be able to make this dream 
a reality for the Kenyan youth of today and of the future. We thank you uh, for this day and we pray for the rest of the day that, Lord, you go ahead of us and guide us in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. Thank you so much and God bless you.